All right. Well, thanks so much uh, for the invitation to join today and for organizing this workshop. I'm really looking forward to um, a great afternoon of discussion and presentations, and I really appreciate the opportunity to share with you. I'm going to spend my time today talking about aging across the life course and the ways that integrating biological and social data, including these new and big data sources, can advance the study of aging, in particular by allowing investigation into aging processes in young and otherwise healthy adults um, before chronic disease and other morbidities of aging manifest. So the outline for what I'll talk about today, I'm going to cover three main topics. I want to first start with three perspectives on aging that are, I think, advanced by this integration of biological and social data. Next, I'll briefly introduce the biological data that are collected in Ad Health, highlighting the promises and I also think some of the challenges of these new and big data. And then I'm going to give you two examples um, of my work and my colleagues' work on health disparities using these kinds of data. So as I mentioned, I think there are three perspectives on aging where I believe the integration of biological and social science offers the most promise. Um, the first is the conceptualization of aging as a life course process, which suggests that later life health and disease outcomes that are typically observed in old age are actually rooted in exposures and experiences across all ages, across the entire life course. And so this means that in order to address aging outcomes, we need to start addressing the antecedents of aging across the life course. And yet it can be difficult to study aging and disease in young populations that on the surface may appear and feel healthy. And so this is where the integration of biological measures can be particularly powerful in helping us examine health risks before disease is manifest. And this is where I think the new data are really exciting. The second perspective is that not only does aging occur, um, sorry, my screen is freezing. Uh, aging occurs sort of gradually across the life course as a cross system uh, process of physiological deterioration. I'm just moving my uh, screen around here. So uh, it's a process that we can think of as this kind of accumulating wear and tear that occurs across biological systems. And drawing from the jar of science perspective, this biological process of aging is really a risk factor for the multitude of diseases and morbidities that we observe with increasing age. And so big data here across the genome, the epigenome, the transcriptome, the proteome, the microbiome, all provide an unprecedented opportunity to study this process of gradual decline across biological systems and levels of measurement. And finally, health disparities across the life force can be conceptualized, I think, as a process of accelerated aging. And oftentimes the biological mechanisms that are hypothesized to underlie these patterns is a chronic activation of the stress response system um, akin to some of what Steve was talking about, which then has this cascade of physiological consequences, again, across multiple biological systems. And so I think with the new and big data that are provided by the integration of biological measurements, we are actually more able to fully test these models, such as models of minority stress and health disparities, and to really understand the mechanisms through which social inequalities become biologically embedded. So I'm going to move now to a discussion of the data that are in Ad Health. Um, one study that has contributed, I think, immensely to the integration of social and biological data is the National Longitudinal Study of Adolescent to Adult Health, or Ad Health. So for those of you who, who are unfamiliar, Ad Health is a nationally representative longitudinal study of adolescents in grades 7 through 12 in 1994 who have been followed up over five waves of data collection and are in their late 30s and early 40s in the most recent wave. And Ad Health includes really rich survey data on a wide variety of topics, including health behaviors, peer networks, family, socioeconomic status, and physical and mental health. And there are also 
thousands of contextual measures of the social and physical environment. So I want us to keep those in mind as well when we're thinking about new data in the study of aging. From its inception, Ad Health has integrated biological information into its study design, in particular with an embedded genetic sample of 3,000 sibling and twin pairs, as well as anthropometric measurements. And under the stewardship and directorship of uh, Dr. Kathy Harris, who's pictured here, Ad Health has really expanded the collection of biological data to include measures of metabolic, cardiovascular, immune function, inflammation, as well as multi-omics data from the genome, epigenome, transcriptome, and microbiome. And so I think here is where there are some really exciting new possibilities. Data that are being generated now in Ad Health span molecular levels, creating millions of measures for thousands of individuals. And while much of our current analysis often focuses on a single level of molecular function, I think this explosion of big data will really allow the integration of complementary and synergistic interactions between multiple molecular levels and across the life course, providing deeper insight into the etiology of aging and disease. And so here we have a nice um, schematic of kind of the multi-omic approach here where we see uh, multi-omic variation in the genome, epigenome, transcriptome, proteome, and metabolome. And a lot of these um, different levels of measurement are being collected in ad health. And I think that the next step in advancing aging research really relies on approaches that can integrate these data across multiple levels. So while we integrate these new and innovative data, I also think it's important for us to not lose sight of the value of a population perspective that we all bring um, with our demographic training and framework. And I want us to consider how the field can benefit from a demographic perspective. Our emphasis on population representation is perhaps the most important priority, I think, that we have brought to this field. So the integration of biological measures into nationally representative data sets like Ad Health, like Health and Retirement Study, ensures that advances in the understanding of aging biology occurs across population groups. Representative and diverse samples enable the study of health disparities and help promote health equity. The longitudinal design of these studies also permits integration of this life course perspective, identifying risks before diseases manifest and providing opportunity to examine intra-individual change and possibly identify causal effects over time. These samples are also oftentimes the largest of their kind, um, often by several orders of magnitude, and they allow them for greater power to detect important relationships between social and environmental variables and aging. Finally, the studies also include rich contextual and individual data that when integrated with the biological measures really enable a new kind of discovery of the relationships and pathways in the study of health and aging. So I wanna spend the rest of my time demonstrating some of these values using examples from our work in Ad Health. And again, I'm going to focus on the life course origins of health disparities with two different sets of examples. The first documenting demographic and life course profiles of gene expression, and the second looking into health disparities by documenting the unequal returns to educational attainment. Uh, so I think you see a familiar face here in work led by Steve Cole together with Kathy Harris, Mike Shanahan, and myself we investigated sociodemographic variation in gene expression in ad health. And we considered demographic factors that really shape risk and aging along which many health disparities are patterned. So specifically, we looked at age, sex, race and ethnicity, poverty and geographic location of residents, as well as a variety of health behaviors. Um, and what did we find? Does gene expression vary by these important sociodemographic factors? Um, we found that, in fact, in genome-wide differential expression analysis, where the up or down regulation of um, genes is different by greater than 20% between the groups, there's actually hundreds of genes that are differentially expressed according to each factor. And importantly, these differences in gene expression are observable in mid-adulthood. So this is uh, ages 32 to 42, 
which suggests that the molecular underpinnings of aging disparities are already present in individuals in their mid 30s. So which biological pathways play a role? We also investigated specific biological pathways by testing associations between these sociodemographic factors and three particular gene sets. These include two major immunoregulatory gene modules that are involved in innate immunity and demonstrated to play a significant role in chronic disease and longevity. Uh, this is inflammation and type one interferon response. So these are then combined to the third gene set, which is the conserved transcriptional response to adversity. So on the right here, you see a plot which has the F test for significance across the gene set uh, with the association and its p-value. So what did we find, just to kind of interpret this for you here? Broadly speaking, the type one interferon gene expression varied most strongly as a function of the individual demographic characteristics. And so you can kind of see that up here. Um, whereas the inflammatory gene expression pathways varied most strongly as a function of the biobehavioral factors down here. And so taken together, I think this, these sets of findings demonstrate the activity of genes involved in inflammation and antiviral responses could help explain some of the sociodemographic disparities in chronic disease that we emerge much later in life. Keeping with the gene expression data, in another project, which is led by Cecilia Potente, who's pictured here, we also use these data to explore the influence of body size on health across the life course. We measured body size at five different life stages, at birth, adolescence, early adulthood, young adulthood, and early midlife. And we constructed three gene expression-based disease signatures for cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes, and inflammation using genes discovered in um, GWAS from out-of-sample studies. And using a Bayesian modeling strategy, we examined the relative associations between body size and gene expression disease signatures, comparing different life course models of sensitive periods and accumulation. Briefly, what this analytic strategy does is estimate the relative contribution of body size at different periods in the life course by creating a weighted vector that sums to one. So um, in each of these columns here, these factors sum to one. And so you can think of this as um, higher weight indicating a larger relative contribution to the overall lifetime effect of body weight on these um, disease expression profiles. So what we find is that for cardiovascular disease and type two diabetes, the results are consistent with a sensitive period model where birth weight plays the most prominent role as well as current weight status. But in contrast, the results for inflammation are more consistent with an accumulation model where body size in all stages contributes pretty similarly, though the relative contribution is still largest for birth weight and declines for each subsequent period. So I think the results of this work also reaffirm the importance of early life and in particular prenatal con uh, conditions on health across the life course and suggest differential life course patterns based on the disease outcome of interest. I wanna turn now to my second set of examples which are integrating biomarker data to document and interrogate racial and ethnic health disparities. This work is really motivated by prior research that documents disparities in life expectancy by education and race. Here we have life expectancy at age 25 by education and race for black women and men and for white women and men. And what I want you to notice is the gap between the lowest and highest education groups, which is large for white women at nine years and almost half that large for black women at five years. And so in a series of papers, my colleagues and I have investigated the life course patterning of these differential returns to educational attainment by race and ethnicity using biomarker data. Uh, again, using data from Ad Health, we observe a pattern here that's consistent with the differential returns observed in life expectancy. So here I'm showing you the predicted probability of metabolic syndrome, which is a composite measure of health risk that includes five different biomarkers. 
What we find is that for white and Hispanic adults, they're age 24 to 32 here, they're significantly less likely to have metabolic syndrome if they completed college compared to their peers who did not. But in contrast, for Black young adults, they're actually um, just as likely to have metabolic syndrome regardless of their college attainment status. So these findings demonstrate that the patterns we observe in terms of life expectancy are not only observable in young adulthood, but perhaps even more pronounced. The patterns are not observed when we look at self-reported health measures, but are observed across a wide variety of biomarkers, which I think underscores the value of biological measurement across the life course. One exciting new data opportunity that we have in Ad Health is to explore broader roles of social and contextual factors. So in ancillary studies, uh, Taylor Hargrove and I have added a lot of additional contextual data to add health. And so here I'm disaggregating the college completion groups that I just showed you, but focusing on institutional expenditures. So these are institutions that spend um, low amounts of money on their students on average versus high expenditures on average. And what we see is that for whites, the health benefit of college completion is really robust across institution types. For Hispanics, there is a gradient with low expenditure college completion um, going sort of in the negative direction, but a significant reduction only with high expenditure institutions. But for black adults, there's no reduction associated with college completion when they attend low expenditure institutions. If anything, there's a suggestion of slightly increased risk. But there is a significant reduction associated with completion at high expenditure institutions. And so I think that these findings demonstrate the precarity of the health benefit associated with college completion and educational attainment more broadly for Black Americans. This pattern of findings is echoed in recent work that's led by Taylor Hargrove, pictured here with Alexis Dennis, who are both at UNC. And here we are investigating the role of county context in shaping the health benefits of educational attainment. And again, using the newly available contextual data, we examine the role of economic, political, and social factors in the county of birth, using measures like absolute um, mobility, income inequality, education and health investment, and educational attainment. So we look here at a, a composite measure of health risk again, here cardiometabolic risk that includes biomarkers across the cardiovascular metabolic system. And I'm presenting findings here for educational context where we have county levels of high school dropout. So the um, predicted cardiometabolic rate in the triangle are for individuals with no college degree and the circle are for those with college degree or more. Um, on the left-hand side, inside the, the little markers, there's an H where they have high high school dropout and an L for where there's low high school dropout. So you can think of counties that have high high school dropout, perhaps where there's underinvestment and underperformance in educational settings versus those with low high school dropout, perhaps having higher investment and better educational outcomes. So for whites, again, consistent with the results I showed you on college context, what we find is that the health benefit of college completion is pretty robust across different county contexts, right? Those with a college degree experience significantly lower predicted cardiometabolic risk compared to those with no degree. Um, the pattern is different though for black and Hispanic adults. And we see actually for black adults in particular, the only instance in which they experience the health benefit of college completion is when they're coming from counties with low high school dropout rates or um, you know, good investments in educational context. So taken together, I think these findings again demonstrate the precarity of health benefits of educational attainment for minority adults. I want to mention that um, Taylor Hargrove and I are also conducting an ancillary study using the biospecimen archive in Ad Health, and this is an opportunity that's available um, for any researchers that make a proposal to the Ad Health project team. And so what we've done is uh, propose to use the dry blood spot markers from wave four to get additional measures of immune and inflammatory um, response in individuals. And so we're planning to look at these same kinds of patterns and health disparities investigating these particular pathways. 
So I'm going to close again just by considering some challenges and opportunities that are presented by this area of research. I think that there is particularly in, in my field of sociology concern that this pursuit of um, biological mechanisms will distract from the structural determinants of health and illness that we're so interested and invested in. Um, but I think that this is also an opportunity for us to help strengthen causal arguments by further explicating the mechanisms through which these social environments become biologically embedded. I think there's also a danger that by incorporating biological measurements, we can start to biologize group difference. Um, and so I encourage us to be active in sort of our anti-racist and anti-sexist approaches to this type of research to counter this reductionist view of health and address health disparities. So I'd like to acknowledge uh, the Center on Aging and Population Sciences at UC and the uh, UT and the Population Research Center. And I thank you for your attention and look forward to discussion and questions. Thanks, Lauren. I wondered if our co-participants or anyone on the call would like to raise their hand to uh, chime in with a question. One thing that occurs to me, Lauren, is that as, as we might see a little bit later today, uh, when we compare studies that use genetic data versus other measure, measurements like what you're doing is the, that you actually have uh, groups of individuals being represented that are not your only European ancestry. And I'm wondering if you could say a little bit more about the value of, of that part of your approach. Absolutely. So, um... You know, I think that that is, again, one of the um, strengths that demographers in particular can bring to this area of research and in our, um, you know, dedication to population representation that includes, include, you know, data from diverse groups. And so um, I think in terms of interest in health disparities, really incorporating diverse sets of samples is essential. Um, you know, we can't study these things without that. And I think the diversity of our samples also helps us um, avoid sort of reproducing these health inequalities. And, and maybe if, if we don't see another hand, you know, if you, if you had a minute to say what, um, just to pitch what else is in the data that might be interesting to the people on the call who don't know the ad health very well, especially the contextual data that you've been uh, merging recently. Yeah, so I think that uh, the data that we have been most excited about and we've gotten a lot of enthusiasm for are integrating the measures from the um, Opportunity Insights database. So these are the data that Raj Chetty and Nate Hendren put together on, on sort of county level mobility. Uh, this includes race and sex specific mobility rates for all counties in the US. What's really nice is the cohort that they used was born, I think, from 1977 to 1982, and that lines up almost perfectly with ad health. And so it was kind of fortuitous that this really fantastic data source that they've generated um, is relevant for this, you know, rich nationally representative longitudinal data set. Lauren, I had a question about, um, thanks for that great presentation, super interesting work. I was wondering um, with all this work that you're doing, looking at disparities uh, between blacks and Hispanics and whites and finding kind of more disparities despite you know social mobility and blacks in particular, what are your hypotheses kind of behind what might be going on um, in, in those communities? Thanks, Lauren. I appreciate that question a lot. I think that Previous work has really emphasized um, sort of individual level explanations, so psychosocial types of mechanisms like striving and perseverance, resilience, um, self-control, grit, for example. Uh, and while I think they're certainly important, what we've been really interested in is trying to understand the types of contexts that sort of promote or constrain the health benefits of educational attainment. And so thinking about um, what types of institutions promote the health of upperly mobile Blacks, for, for example, um, what we're actually finding is it's the more sort of elite, well-resourced places that 
um, Black adults are able to translate that educational experience into health promoting benefits. Thanks very much, uh, Lauren. And thanks again for all your presentation so far.